Our first scripture is taken from the book of Joel. And in the most translations, like the New Revised Standard, this is Joel 2, verses 28 through 31. But in the Inclusive Bible, which is a version we're using, it's Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. After that, I will pour out my spirit on all humankind. Your children will prophesy. Your elders will have prophetic dreams and your young people will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on those in servitude, people of all genders alike. I will show signs in the heavens and on the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood at the coming of the great and terrible day of the one who is. And our second reader reading is from Revelation chapter one. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, given by God to show the faithful what must happen very soon. God made it known by sending an angel to John, the faithful subject, who in writing down everything he saw, bears witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Happy are those people who read this prophetic message and happy are those who hear it and heed what is written in it, for the time is near. I, John, your brother, who shares with you the trial, the kingdom, and the perseverance we have in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because I proclaimed God's word and bore witness to Jesus. It was the first day of the week, and I was in the spirit, when suddenly I heard behind me a piercing voice like the sound of a trumpet. Let us pray. Eternal God, incarnate word, spirit of flame and dove, enlarge, expand all living souls to comprehend your love and help us all to seek your will with wiser powers conferred, O God, grant yet more light and truth to break forth from your word. Amen. So earlier in the service, I asked those of you who are worshiping with us live to share in the chat some of your initial impressions of the book of Revelation. And I wanna share some of the things that you said. George and Linda said that it's an exciting puzzle. Barb said she doesn't remember it being addressed. Beverly said, I don't understand Revelation and therefore I avoid it. Birch said, weird book. I can't make sense of it. Lynn said it was scary. Jerome and Bobette said it was bizarre and they don't have a code to translate the images. Bridget said, magical, mystical, fantastical. Bob and Patty said, affixing pain of reality by being elsewhere. And Catherine said that she's looking forward to perhaps finding something other than ravings in Revelation, that it's perhaps one of the most misused books in the Bible. And I appreciate y'all's honesty and willingness to share what you think about the book of Revelation. And I want to say that I hear all of it. I get why it's easy to read the book of Re Revelation as weird or creepy or trippy or bizarre. I get why Catherine says that she's mostly just heard ravings in it. I get the ways in which a particularly conservative, reactionary expression of Christianity has popularized an interpretation of Revelation that is unloving, bigoted, fear-based, and punitive. So with all of that being said, I get why you might have raised your eyebrows when you saw that my sermon series this month at our progressive church is all about revelation and the tools it offers for resisting empire. I get it. And I want you to know that you're not alone in that. Revelation was so controversial among early church leaders that it almost didn't make it into the Bible at all. Writing about church history in the early fourth century Eusebius wrote that the opinions of most people are still divided as to whether or not Revelation ought to be considered an authoritative part of the biblical canon. Centuries later, Martin Luther wrote that Revelation is neither apostolic nor prophetic, basically saying that it didn't have much to justify its inclusion in the New Testament. And then there was Ulrich Zwingli, another leader of the Protestant Reformation and a forebear to John Calvin, who just wanted to cut it out of the Bible altogether. 
just as Protestants excised certain Old Testament texts when splitting from the Roman Catholic Church. So if Revelation freaks you out, and you'd rather ignore it, and you're not even sure if it really belongs in the Bible, you're in good company. And you're probably thinking that all that begs the question, if Revelation is creepy and weird and bizarre and full of ravings and a favorite of hyper-conservative doomsday Christians and it barely made it into the Bible in the first place, why is Daniel going to spend a whole month preaching on it? I don't preach very often and never before for a whole month at a time. So why did I choose something so frankly bizarre to preach on? Why didn't I choose something easy and nice and comforting? Well, I've been asking myself that question this week as well. And there are a couple of reasons. A big reason is that Revelation is part of the Bible. But I'm not a big fan of ignoring parts of the Bible that freak us out or make us uncomfortable or that we think we're going to disagree with. Sometimes, often, it takes a hearty dose of self-compassion and courage and community to brave the harder stuff in scripture. But I think that when we do, we're giving ourselves opportunities for new discoveries, profound insights, and spiritual transformation. Maybe you'll come away still not liking what you read. God knows there's parts of the Bible that I don't really like. But I think the struggle with God and with the text can birth powerful things in us. And my parents are in church today and they can tell you that I have a sort of stubborn side to myself. I know you'd never would have guessed. And I don't like conceding elements of Christianity to right-wing Christians. Maybe it's not the most mature or gracious attitude to take, but it's real. It's how I feel. I feel like if I let the left behind books be the loudest voice about the book of Revelation, I'm letting an expression of Christianity that I don't believe reflects the best of our faith claim an authority that it doesn't deserve. So if the conservatives are going to talk about Revelation, I'm going to talk about it a lot too, because I don't think their interpretation is the only one. But the simplest reason for why I'm preaching on Revelation is that it's my favorite book of the Bible. It has been ever since my junior year of college, when I took a class called Revelation and Resistance that basically explored liberation theology readings of Revelation. The thesis of that class was that Revelation was written to be a spiritual and political propaganda piece against the Roman Empire, and that we can read it today as an inspiration for resisting the forces of empire as they show up in our worlds. Class was really cool. We did things like spend a day in the mall, making note of how modern consumer capitalism reflects some of the same things that Revelation critiques about the Roman economy. Our final presentation in the class was about a community that we thought embodied the values of Revelation. And I chose to present about lesbian and separatist communes. That class changed my whole relationship with the Bible. And I hope I can spark some of what it ignited in me with you. So today I wanna to talk a little bit broadly about Revelation as apocalyptic literature and why I think that apocalyptic thinking is an essential part of faith and of justice work. And obviously the first part of that is defining what I mean by apocalyptic, because that is a word that is super duper loaded for most of us. In Greek, the first word of the book of Revelation is apocalypsis. And for that reason, the book is also sometimes known as the Apocalypse of John. And actually, whether you call the book the Revelation to John or the Apocalypse of John, you're really saying the same thing. Etymologically, the two words, Apocalypse and Revelation, are essentially synonyms. Because in Greek, the word apocalypsis doesn't carry the connotations of disaster and violence that the English word apocalypse does for us. In modern usage, we tend to use the word apocalypse to describe the end of the world or something that feels like it, at least. Severe snowstorms are sometimes deemed snowpocalypses on social media. The horror anthology TV show American Horror Story had a recent season called Apocalypse that focused on the aftermath of a worldwide nuclear winter. In the X-Men comic universe, there's a supervillain whose name is simply Apocalypse, and he tries to destroy the world over and over. And there are dozens of movies, TV shows, and video games that explore what we've come to call the zombie apocalypse. So I want to be really clear that when I'm talking about cultivating apocalyptic thinking and living, I'm not using the word in the sense of a zombie takeover, or a supervillain, or the end of the world. 
In biblical Greek, the word apocalypsis literally means unveiling, uncovering. Progressive Bible scholar Bart Ehrman describes the genre of apocalyptic literature in scripture as a vision of heavenly secrets that can make sense of earthly realities. In this sense, apocalyptic passages in the Bible function in a very similar way to prophecy in the Bible. They use language about the future to tell us something about the present. They use language about heaven to tell us something about earth. And I wanna note for a minute what it might say about our culture that a word that literally refers to telling the truth about the world has come to mean a disaster. For whom is it actually a disaster if we're honest about the world around us? I would suggest that the more invested we are in the status quo, the more an apocalypse, an unveiling feels like a disaster. When we are invested in the way things are, we become equally invested in the myths that uphold our understanding of the world. I think you can see this dynamic at work in the current right-wing oppression with critical race theory, or CRT for short. We'll leave for another day the fact that what Fox News and Breitbart and President Trump are calling critical race theory actually has very little to do with the actual academic approach of that name. But I think the way that re the reactionary right has become fixated on what they call CRT is a great example of why apocalyptic thinking feels like a disaster to the privileged and powerful. What opponents of so-called CRT object to is the idea that our schools and the media might start even if haltingly and imperfectly lifting the veil on the ways in which white supremacy pervades our modern society. White people in this country have a lot invested in the myths of our culture that function to veil the ways that white supremacy persists today. White supremacy shows up in even the most mundane ways that we move through the world. But our myths about race don't allow white folks in particular to perceive that. If we get honest about race and racism in our lives and in our culture, those of us who are white have to confront the fact that we have benefited in big ways and small ways from a deeply entrenched racial hierarchy that privileges whiteness above all else. That might feel like a disaster to us, it might feel like the end of the world as we know it, but that's part of embracing apocalyptic honesty. And look, the irony of preaching about this on the 4th of July is not lost on me to be sure perhaps rivaled only by Thanksgiving, our celebrations today are traditionally an assertion of the myths of our society, a celebration of the lies we tell ourselves to keep the ugly truths about our nation's past and present veiled and obscured. Social media today will be full of posts about freedom and justice and liberty, but any mention of the fact that the Declaration of Independence adopted this day in 1776 included horrifically dehumanizing language about indigenous Americans is just dismissed as unpatriotic. It's seen in many circles as unnecessarily negative and politically correct to bring up the historical reality that of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 41 were what we casually call slave owners, which is really just a polite way of saying that they were active human traffickers who had no interest in extending the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to the Black people whose labor they stole and whose very personhood they purported to own. People all over the country today are going to sing about how they're proud to be Americans, where at least they know they're free. And they're going to give absolutely no thought to the fact that the United States incarcerates 21% of the world's population, of the world's prisoners despite making up less than 5% of the world's population. Land of the free, indeed. The myths that US nationalism relies on to justify itself obscure the unpleasant truths that so many of our neighbors experience firsthand. So apocalyptic thinking begins with telling the truth. One of the only things we're told about the author of the apocalypse is that he has been exiled to the island of Patmos off the coast of Turkey for proclaiming God's word and bearing witness to Jesus. For the oppressive Roman government of the time, 
this was an unforgivable offense. The truth, as Christians understand it, that God is sovereign over the world and desires justice, compassion, and peace for all of creation was a massive threat to the myths of the Roman Empire, which positioned Caesar as himself a god, divinely justified in any acts of violence, repression, and exploitation that he deemed necessary to expand the reach and power of his empire. And that might sound familiar to you. Throughout the apocalypse, as we'll see in the next few weeks, John deploys fantastical language, a dragon with seven heads, one for each of the hills on which Rome was built, a beast that kills all of those who refuse to offer it total allegiance and worship. This language functions to highlight ugly truths about the way the empire of his day functioned. And if we're honest, it exposes equally uncomfortable truths about the ways the empires of our day function as well. For us, apocalyptic truth-telling requires that we be honest, first with ourselves, about the ugly, uncomfortable truths about the world around us and about our place in it. But apocalyptic truth-telling, apocalyptic thinking does not end with truth-telling. Apocalyptic thinking is not just concerned with the way things are, but with the way things could be. When we cultivate an apocalyptic way of perceiving the world, we refuse to believe the lie that the oppressive, unjust, violent, unholy ways that we have been taught to live and think are the only options presented to us. Apocalyptic thinking happens when, together as a community with the spirit of God poured over us, all of us, the young and old, the oppressed and the privileged, people of all genders, allow ourselves to dream of what the world could look like if we truly lived into the values of justice, peace, and love. And the truth is, often is not, that is gonna sound more like fantasy than like political science. It's gonna use the language of poetry instead of the language of policy proposals. Apocalyptic dreaming is creative and subversive and wild, and untamed. When Don Quixote is asked in Man of La Mancha, what he means by following the quest. He responds by singing the show's most iconic song, to dream the impossible dream, to right the unrightable wrong. This is my quest, to follow the star, no matter how hopeless, no matter how far. That's part of apocalyptic thinking. The impossible is not a bad thing in an, in an apocalyptic worldview. It's a starting point. The practical questions of practicality and logistics are so, so, so important for social justice work, but we do a disservice to our potential if we allow pragmatic concerns to constrain our dreams. When we cultivate an apocalyptic sensibility, we allow ourselves to dream of a world with no prisons without asking how we'll rewrite the criminal statutes. We dare to dream of humanity's potential for a flourishing, healing relationship with all of creation without worrying about how we'll get fossil fuel money out of politics. We give ourselves and each other permission to dream of the collapse of the gender binary without constraining ourselves with what we worry the homophobes down the street will think. Nelson Mandela, who, like Revelation's author, John of Patmos, was imprisoned for speaking the liberative truth to an oppressive power, said, it's always impossible until it is done. When we ask pragmatic questions, as we eventually must, we do so in service to our apocalyptic dreams, not in order to constrain them. But that is also not to say that dreaming is only a passive, lukewarm activity. Albus Dumbledore told Harry Potter that it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. Apocalyptic dreaming isn't escapism. It's the foundation for apocalyptic living according to our values. Drag superstar RuPaul, whose own unapologetic dreams brought the queer subversive art of drag farther into the heart of mainstream than anyone could have imagined, says, the most powerful thing you can do is become the image of your own imagination. That's apocalyptic thinking at its finest. Or, Put another way, in another icon of queer culture, we can follow the advice of the finale of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Don't dream it, 
be it. My friend Jessica Vasquez Torres, an anti-racism educator and activist, says that if we want to talk about defunding the police, the first cop we need to defund is the one who lives in our head. I think what she means is that while we work for a justice system that prioritizes restoration over retribution, we must learn to embody that in the way we treat others and ourselves. If we imagine and work for a world with no wars, we have the opportunity and the obligation to commit ourselves to nonviolence in our own lives. If we dream of an end to white supremacy, we begin that work by unlearning the racist ways we have been taught to act and finding new, just, life-giving patterns. Later in Revelation, John will critique the church in the Turkish city of Laodicea for being lukewarm, neither cold nor hot. Apocalyptic living is not lukewarm. It is a red hot embodiment of the world we dream of. So yeah, apocalyptic is a scary word. I don't think it's wrong to be freaked out by the idea. An apocalyptic lifestyle isn't scary because it implies a meteor hitting or zombies roaming the streets. It's scary because it demands that we confront hard truths and dismantle comforting myths. It's scary because it demands that we use that gift that we've been so often taught to suppress in ourselves, our imagination. It's scary because it demands that we embody our dreams and our values every day in our lives. And all of that is frightening and intimidating and uncomfortable. But I think that our tradition and the wisdom that we find in community give us tools for doing that work in a meaningful way. And that when we do it, we will discover a freedom and a joy that we might not even have known was missing from our lives. So that's what I hope we're gonna do this month. I hope that we'll be able to discover some of that together as we continue to explore the apocalypse and the revolution that is waiting for us within Revelation. I invite you now to take a moment to be silent and reflect on what these words said to you. <laughs> 